Howdy everybody, Dr. Andy Woods here. I'm the pastor teacher here at Sugarland Bible Church. This is being released November the 1st, 2024. This is Pastor's Point of View, number 326. We have a prophecy update for you today. Um, as you look at our outline, here are the three major areas that we're going to take a look at in this particular prophecy update. Looking at the subject of globalism, uh, looking at the subject of the rise of Babylon, and looking at the subject of persecution. Um, here we are, November the 1st, November the 5th, we have a national election here in the United States looming on the horizon. Uh, what role will the outcome of that election play in prophecy in terms of the predicted passages, predicting God's uh, predictions of persecution coming against God's people in the last days. So we'll try to connect the dots for you in that regard as well. But let's go ahead and start with globalism. One of the key signs of the end of the age will be uh, one world tyranny. The prophet Daniel 2,600 years ago predicted under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit the final form of Gentile dominion or rulership that would exist on planet Earth before Jesus returns in his second advent. And this is what Daniel saw back in the 6th century BC. It says, thus he said, the fourth beast will be a fourth kingdom on the earth which will be different from all the other kingdoms and will devour the whole earth, whole earth, and tread it down and crush it. This is a prediction of one world tyranny in the last days. One of the things that's interesting is Daniel was more specific. Notice Daniel 7 verse 25. He predicted this one world tyranny would come against the nation of Israel. It says there, he, that's the Antichrist heading up this one world tyranny, will speak out against the Most High and wear down the saints of the Highest One. He will intend to make alterations in times and in law, and they will be given into his hand for a time, times, and a half a time. Now, the saints here of the Most Holy One in context is a reference to the Jewish people and he will wear them down they're actually going to be given into his hand so as we are moving um, in the direction of the fulfillment of these particular prophecies what we're seeing in our world is our world is being set up we're moving in the direction of world government that is largely anti-israel um, in tone so with all of that being said I'd like to provide some documentation for that. Notice this particular article from Breitbart, October the 17th, 2024, fairly recent article. And it has to do with uh, Sinwar, who was recently assassinated by the Israelis, uh, one of the masterminds, if not the mastermind, behind the horrific October 7th attacks against the Jewish people coming from Gaza uh, of last year. The fact that the Israelis assassinated this man is really not, not, not a great surprise in the news world. This is a well-known news item. What isn't really well known is who was guarding this particular man. Who were his bodyguards? And it turns out that those closest to him were connected with the United Nations. And this shows us the alliance between global governance, the United Nations, and anti-Israelism in the last days. The United Nations being in cahoots with an, an anti-Israeli terrorist, forming that connection between global government and anti-Semitism, which shows us how close we are towards the fulfillment of Daniel's prophecies, Daniel predicting the exact same thing. This particular article is entitled, Sinwar Bodyguards Included United Nations Employee, who apparently had a fake passport. 
The article says one of the bodyguards found dead alongside Hamas leader Sinwar on Wednesday was an employee of the United Nations, according to a Thursday report. One of them was a senior commander of Hamas terrorists in the Kahan Yunus area. The other, according to Israeli, the Israeli news site Ynet, was a teacher employed by the United Nations Relief Works Agencies, uh, otherwise known as UNRWA, U-N-R-W-A. UNRWA has been implicated in ideological support for terror, and several of its employees participated in the October 7th attacks. President Donald Trump canceled U.S. funding to UNRWA, but President Joe Biden restored it before suspending it in the wake of the October 7th attacks. So it's interesting that Trump's policy is called an end to this kind of thing, at least from the standpoint of the United States. United States is concerned. And here is Obama reviving it. He, in essence, largely creates the events of October 7th in so doing. And then when it looked like things were getting out of hand, he canceled support. So that's the difference between the Biden administration and the Trump administration policy-wise on this particular issue. But my main point in bringing this up in a prophecy update is to demonstrate that there is a trend in our world towards global governance. That's what the United Nations is all about. And there's a trend towards a symbiotic relationship between global government, the United Nations, and anti-Israelism. Right down to the terrorists, uh, bodyguards, anti-Israel terrorists just assassinated by the Israelis is somehow connected with UNRWA, who is connected with the United Nations. That's the anti-Semitic global government of the last days, which Daniel predicted would come. And when we see these kinds of things, it shows us how close we are towards the fulfillment of Daniel's prophecies. Speaking of the New World Order, um, one of the things the New World Order desperately wants to see happen is they want to see Kamala Harris installed as president. They don't want Trump, a nationalist, as president. They want someone that they could work with, someone that's more global in nature. And so here is the New World Order constantly at work trying to hide information from the American people so that Kamala Harris, the Democratic nominee, for the presidency of the United States, someone that we're all going to vote on, up or down, as we the people, November 5th, the United Nations, the, the uh, New World Order, working in tandem with one another to make her look good, hiding some of her outrageous statements and gaffes um, so that the American people will get behind her for the presidency. So with that being said, Here's a particular article that was very interesting. This is from the New York Post. This is the lengths that the liberal media working in cahoots with the New World Order will go to hide information from people so people don't know exactly who they're voting for on November 5th. It's written October the 21st, 2024, a recent article. And it says CBS News, liberal news outlet, admits Kamala Harris's 60 Minutes answer was cut down. So Kamala Harris in this particular article, uh, particular interview, I should say, with Bill Whitaker, was asked a question and she gave a rambling, incoherent, nonsensical answer. Interestingly, related to Israel in the Middle East in that particular interview. And CBS came in after the fact and doctored it and took something else Kamala Harris said and substituted it for the incoherent statement so that Kamala Harris would not look bad. Now, when a news 
outlet does that, it's really not functioning as a news outlet. It's functioning as a propaganda outlet. But here's what happened. It says, CBS News acknowledged Sunday night that it had trimmed an answer from Vice President Kamala Harris about war in the Middle East during a 60-minute interview that aired this month. On October the 6th, CBS Sunday public, public Sunday morning public affairs program Face the Nation posted a lengthy clip previewing the sit-down with Harris conducted by correspondent Bill Whitaker. This is what Harris said in her initial statement. Well, Bill, and she's asked a question about Israel. That's why I'm bringing this up about how the New World Order <laughs> hates Israel because they want to install someone like Kamala Harris as president. She said, quote, well, well, Bill, Bill Whitaker, the interviewer, the work that we have done has resulted in another of, an, a number of movements in that region by Israel that were much prompted by or a result of many things, including our advocacy for what needs to happen in that region, close quote. That's a rambling, incoherent statement. doesn't make any sense. Harris said this in the promo video uh, shared by Face the Nation on X. When the interview aired the following evening, however, it was made to look as if Harris answered as follows, quote, we are not going to stop pursuing what is necessary for the United States to be clear about where we stand on the need for this war to end, close quote. Not the greatest answer in the world, but at least it makes sense. The article goes on and it says campaign spokesman Caroline Levitt said in a statement, quote, they edited in a different response from another part of her answer to make Kamala Harris sound less incoherent than she really was. Close quote. So <laughs> what's happening is the New World Order is now in full swing to get Kamala Harris um, installed as president. Uh, keep in mind who wants Kamala Harris to be president. We covered in prior shows, Iran wants Kamala Harris as president. Uh, Russia, Putin wants Kamala Harris as, as president. China, if I'm not mistaken, we covered this as well, wants Kamala Harris installed as president. And so it's very interesting to me that all of America's sworn enemies want Kamala Harris installed as president. And so they're trying to sort of cover up her warts, trying to make it sound like she is not as anti-Israel as she actually is, right down to sort of rehabilitating a lot of the statements that she makes that are kind of rambling and babbling and incoherent when she's asked specific and concrete questions about her Middle Eastern policy. Uh, I'm filing all of this under the category of globalism. Globalism is, is at work, uh, clearly developing a relationship between itself and anti-Israel uh, terrorists. Globalism is at work trying to sort of paper over some of Kamala Harris's rambling comments, you know, right down to editing comments that she made. So you're watching something that you think is an interview, which has been highly edited, and it really is not an interview at all. It's an actual propaganda piece. They don't want Donald Trump in charge. They don't want Donald Trump in power because he's anti-New World Order. He's a nationalist and not a globalist. And so let's paper over some of the uh, craziness of Kamala Harris so the average American going to the voting booth won't know exactly who they, they are pulling the lever for. The election of Kamala Harris, should it occur, will be a tremendous triumph for the New World Order or, or globalism, which Daniel himself predicted would be alive and well 
just before the second advent of Jesus Christ. And just to show you how aggressive the New World Order is in this current election cycle, notice this particular article from ZeroHedge.com, a very recent article again, October the 19th, 2024. The title of it is, This is Illegal. British Labour, very liberal, British Labour Party sending its own staff to campaign for Kamala in swing states. Now, British Labour is very liberal, very leftist, very pro-globalist, very pro-New World Order. They don't want to work with Donald Trump. They want to work with Kamala Harris. So they're involved in breaking our own election laws by coming over to campaign for Kamala in key swing states. That's how invested the New World Order is in this current presidential election cycle. The article says the head of operations of the left leftist British Labour Party, which is now in government after 14 years of being the opposition, declared in a LinkedIn post that she is organizing a party of 100 staff members to be sent to swing states in the U.S. to campaign for Kamala Harris, prompting charges of election interference. Ex-owner Elon Musk chimed in to note that Patel's, that's the organizer of this proposed plan, is simply illegal. It's flat out illegal. It's so illegal that Americans have alerted the police. And what is being said here is uh, the British are coming. <laughs> and how well did that work out in 1776 for the British? What they're saying is the same thing is happening. Here is labor, very liberal, very globalist in Britain, coming out very openly and saying we're going to intentionally interfere in the American election cycle because we don't want nationalist Donald Trump in the office. We want globalist Kamala Harris. So the forces of global governance are at work trying to put in place the right political figure, the right political player that will live in harmony with the new world order and not oppose it the way Donald Trump will. This is all signs of the times. The power of globalism. The power of global governance, which will manifest itself in the last days. Um, here is uh, something from X by Elon Musk reacting to all of this, saying this is illegal. And here he's reacting to someone that said, a hundred UK labor Politicians are campaigning on behalf of Kamala Harris across battleground states. Isn't this foreign election interference? Imagine if a member of Russia Duma did this. And here's what Labor originally wanted to do. Sophia Patel says, quote, I have nearly 100 Labor Party staff, current and former, uh, going to the U.S. in the next few weeks, heading to North Carolina, Nevada, Pennsylvania, and Virginia. What do all those states have in common? Those are the states where this presidential election will most likely be decided. She says, I have 10 spots available for anyone available to head to the battleground state of North Carolina. We will sort your housing. Email me, gives her email address if you're interested. Thank you. Very, very blatant. Very, very globalist. Very, very illegal. And yet this is how the New World Order operates, whether it's the news outlets, whether it's Labor Party in the UK. They want to move in the direction of globalism. They don't want to work with someone like nationalist Donald Trump. And so... It gets right down to their desire or ambition to interfere in our presidential election. This is the bizarre time period that we find ourselves in. And it's largely connected to this ambition to globalize the world. Right down to Facebook posts. Um, notice this particular article here from the Daily Mail. 
very recent. October the 17th, 2024. It fits well this theme of New World Order media not wanting the American people to learn the truth about Marxist Kamala Harris. The title of the article is Facebook Engineer Admits the Site Automatically Demotes Anti-Kamala Posts to Help the Democrats. Here's what the article says. It says a meta-engineer claim that Facebook has autom been automatically demoting posts criticizing Kamala Harris and undercover sting. Senior engineer, um, this particular individual, uh, Guy Whaley, if I'm pronouncing that right, was caught by a hidden camera while on a date <laughs> discussing how Meta's algorithms and content moderation practices reduce the visibility of certain political posts without notifying the users. He provided an explanation to the unknown woman who sat at, uh, at the other side of the table. This was all caught on camera, by the way, saying if someone posts about hair about Harris is unfit to be president because she doesn't have a child or that kind of use of profanity is automatically devoted, demoted. This particular individual, age 32, also said that Meta has the ability to influence the 2024 election, claiming that CEO Mark Zuckerberg plans to use that power to help the Democrats. So you wonder why this election is close. You wonder why the American people doesn't know what it should know about Kamala Harris. It's because social media is being manipulated where you can't know the truth. CBS is manipulating what it airs as an interview so that you really can't know the truth. The article goes on and it says the video comes just two months after Zuckerberg admitted Facebook censored uh, COVID misinformation at the demands of the Biden administration. We've reported on that already in prior shows. In a letter to the House Judiciary Committee's Chairman Jim Jordan, published August 26th, Zuckerberg confessed that the Biden administration was wrong to demand Facebook censor what they deemed COVID misinformation during the pandemic. So Facebook social media is in the tank for a far left government narrative and they are already on record admitting that they take out of what you can see via algorithms etc key information that you need to make that you need to make key decisions right down to voting uh, right down to am i going to pursue health option A or health option B. The information that you need to make the decision is being demoted so that most Americans can't see it. What's happening right now with Kamala Harris and the truth about her is being demoted so most Americans can't see it. Why is the new world order in the tank for Kamala Harris, whether it's Facebook, whether it's CBS, because they don't want a nationalist in the White House because that will slow down the progress into New World Order. And that is really the definitive issue of our time. That's why they are doing what they are doing. It's sad, but at the same time, it's understandable. In light of what God says about the end times, humanity would make a tremendous uh, would make tremendous progression into globalism on the eve of the second advent of our Lord Jesus Christ, uh, as is clear from Daniel's prophecies. I mean, not only would we have global government, but global government would be anti-Israel in tone and in theme. And that's why there's so much information that's surfacing about the connection between Sinwar and UNRWA. 
So I bring all of these things to your attention on this particular prophecy update. Let's go to our second major category, and it has to do with Babylon. Because the New World Order, global governance, which is forming, needs a physical headquarters. And Bible prophecy indicates that those headquarters will be located in the rebuilt city of Babylon. Where are we getting this from? We're getting it from Revelation chapter 17 and verse 18, which describes this harlot of the last days, uh, global religion. And it says this, the woman which you saw is the great city which reigns over the kings of the earth. So this New World Order religious system is going to come to our world and control our world from a particular city. And as you read Revelation 14, around verse 8, Revelation 16, verse 19, and the countless references in Revelation 17 and 18, we know that that city is none other than the city of Babylon. Babylon is used 300 times in Scripture, and it's a technical word. It always means the physical city of Babylon located between the Euphrates and the Tigris. Notice the comments of Bullinger in his Revelation commentary on Revelation 17, verse 18. He says, God says it's a city. He does not say a system or a religion, but a city. The Greek word there in chapter 17, verse 18 is polis, where we get the word metropolis from. Where is that city located? Notice this particular map here. It's the city of Babylon. The city of Babylon has an actual location between the rivers. Sometimes it's called Shinar in Hebrew. Mesopotamia in Greek. Meso between Potamia rivers, between the rivers, between the Euphrates and the Tigris. That's what Babylon means in the Bible. It's a technical term and it always is referring to that particular city. It's where the Tower of Babel was built. It's the exact area, Daniel chapter 1, verse 2 tells us, where the children of Israel were taken 350 miles to the east from the land of Israel into the Babylonian captivity. I, I have a book out on this subject, if you're interested. It's called Babylon, the Bookends of Prophetic History. It lays out the literal biblical case for the city of Babylon rising to dominance in the last days. And it goes through the typical objections people typically have to a literal interpretation of prophecy here. Uh, if you want to go deeper into the subject, I recommend this uh, a particular book that I wrote. But we expect Babylon to enjoy a resurgence in the last days. That's why we have uh, reported on this uh, All Fa project. Um, it's a dry canal uh, and an international canal that, as you can see from the map, is going to go from Turkey um, to the Persian Gulf, passing right through Iraq, passing very near the literal city of Babylon, and this will probably become part of the reason why Babylon will enjoy economic resurgence in the last days. So a key indicator showing us the time period that we're living in will be the restoration and the resurgence of Babylon, which will be the headquarters of the New World Order in the, in the future tribulation period. So with all of that being said, that's why I found this particular article from Iraq Business News so interesting. Keep in mind where Iraq is. Iraq is Shinar, Mesopotamia, Babylonia. Between the Euphrates and the Tigris, that part of the world, uh, which is the home of the literal city of Babylon, which has never been completely destroyed and is likely prophetically to enjoy a global resurgence in the last days. That's why I found this particular article interesting. All of these things are setting the stage 
for the role of Babylon in the end times. Notice this article from IraqBusinessNews.com, October 21st, 2024, recent article once again. Iraq grants $69 billion in investment licenses in 18 months. Speaking at the Investment Forum for Businessmen and Investors in Babylon on October the 15th, the head of Iraq's National Investment Commission, the NIC, commissioned the importance of developing tailored investment maps for each province, ensuring projects meet local needs. Uh, it mentions here a Dr. Makia noted that over... 69 billion in investment licenses have been granted in the last 18 months with innovative projects exempt from competitive bidding to foster creativity and avoid what he described as unfair competition. Now, you'll notice the first line in the article mentions Babylon. Speaking at the Investment Forum for Businessmen and Investors in Babylon. This is where this financial disclosure took place. The article concludes by saying the forum showcased 55 investment opportunities in Babylon. Notice the name Babylon is mentioned again. Spanning sectors such as commerce, housing, agriculture, industry, education, health, and tourism. Local officials, including um, the governor, emphasized the province's strategic location and its fertile land along the Euphrates River, pledging full support for projects that enhance infrastructure and economic growth. Iraq coming to life economically. Babylon coming to life economically. Babylon coming to life economically on the banks of the Euphrates River. That's what this article is talking about. That's what God said would happen at the end of the age. And so it becomes another significant development uh, when we look at the spectrum of prophecies that are all setting the stage for the end time scenario in harmony and unison with each other. Now, one of the things to understand about Babylon, when you get into Revelation 17, Revelation 18, is Babylon is going to be the source of tremendous persecution against God's people. In other words, coming from that city will be a system that will persecute God's people, ushering in a wave of persecution which is unprecedented. And so this takes us to our final category that we want to consider in this particular prophecy update. And it has to do with end times persecution. Remember what God predicted through the Apostle John in Revelation 17 and verse 6. John writes, And I saw the woman... Now, that's the system coming from the literal city of Babylon. I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the witnesses of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered greatly. Verse 15, and he said to me, the waters which you saw where the harlot sits are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. So this is uh, global persecution against God's people from a system located in the literal city of Babylon. Now, how does all of this relate to the looming November 5th presidential election? Depending on how this election goes, uh, Christians and conservatives and constitutionalists are going to be start to be, I should say, put under tremendous persecution. Because those that are on the Democratic side of the aisle do not believe in First Amendment protection. In other words, if Walls and Harris, or Harris and Walls, win this election, we would be putting someone into a place of political power that, that essentially don't believe in free speech, like I'm employing here. 
They don't believe in the free expression of ideas like I am employing here. And they are all about curtailing and even illegalizing free speech. Now you think, well, certainly, you know, I'm exaggerating. But to show you that I'm not exagger exaggerating, let me draw your attention to this Washington Times article. October 11th, 2024, another recent article. It says conservatives joined together to defend free speech from the, f the threat that they see in the Harris Walls agenda. The article says more than a dozen conservative leaders have coalesced in opposition to what they say is the the Harris Walls tickets agenda of unconstitutional violations of free speech. The leaders and groups they represent have endorsed a letter outlining the threat they say Vice President Kamala Harris and her running mate Tim Walls pose, citing actions that Miss Harris and the Minnesota Governor Tim Walls have taken in their political careers. In other words, this is not hard to figure out. All you do is you research what Tim Walls did as the governor of Minnesota in the area of free speech, and you research what Kamala Harris did as the attorney general in the state of California, and you can see that these people are hostile to free speech and First Amendment protection for any ideas that go against the narrative they want to promulgate. Um, it says here, in particular, the letter points to Mrs. Ha Miss Harris's crusade as California, California Attorney General to force conservative nonprofit groups, such as Americans for Prosperity, to produce donor lists. You have an agenda that's contrary to what we want to promote? And you're a, what does it say here, nonprofit? Then cough up your donor list. We want to see where your money comes from. Now that goes against the Constitution. It goes against a Supreme Court case. It goes against privacy. It goes against the First Amendment. But this is the total, totalitarian mindset of Kamala Harris. The article says... Uh, it is, it's, with this being said, quote, we reject efforts to silence speech and weaponize the government against conservative advocacy groups and their donors. You want to see the government weaponized against conservative advocacy groups and their donors, like the Americans for Prosperity? then put Kamala Harris into the presidency, and you'll see it. They said Ms. Harris and Mr. Walls have used government power to silence conservatives and warned it foreshadowed what a Harris-Walls administration would do. Other incidents cited in the letter include, number one, as vice president, Ms. Harris cast the tie-breaking vote in the Senate to pass, to pass the Inflation Reduction Act, which is a joke, because inflation is running rampant now. There's been no inflation reject, reduction. But even beyond that, what did that act do? It led to the hiring of a thousand IRS agents. That's what Kamala Harris did by casting that tie-breaking vote. In her time as California Attorney General, she allegedly launched a politically motivated investigation and prosecution of David uh, Delayden in 2015. Mr. Delayden of the Center for Medical Progress and a colleague went undercover at the National Abortion Federation's commercial trade show and took video of Planned Parent executives handling body parts of aborted fetuses. Mr. Delayden's legal saga has been ongoing for the last nine years. He faces eight felony charges. Think about that. And possible jail time in California. Why? Because he did something politically incorrect. He caught these... Planned 
Parenthood executives via hidden camera making all kinds of grotesque and callous comments about aborted baby parts. And so for that, he faces eight penalty, uh, felonies and potential jail time. Why is that? Because Kamala Harris used the force of the California Attorney General's office when she was AG in California to go after this man who's using his free speech rights in a way differently than what she deems acceptable. The article goes on and it says, as Minnesota Governor Tim Walz signed sweep, a sweeping election bill that included stiffer regulations of political ads that require nonprofits in the state that engage in political speech to disclose donors. Mr. Walls also established a hotline during the COVID-19 pandemic for people to report violations of social distancing, which the letter likened to mechanisms established by communist governments to place enemies of the state on a government watch list. The letter said these actions by Mr. Harris and Mr. Walls demonstrate their propensity for turning the government against citizens. I think someone put it this way. The definition of liberty is when the government is afraid of the people. The definition of tyranny is when the people are afraid of the government. I mean, do you want to live in a world where <laughs> you're afraid of your own government? Where free speech is a thing of the past? You want to use a free speech platform or video camera in a way that goes against the politically correct narrative and you want to face eight felonies for doing that, then go ahead and elect Kamala Harris as president. I mean, we've already seen when she was attorney general what she would do in this area. Uh, Tim, Tim Walls is no better. You want, you want things like snitch lines? Hey, I saw someone who didn't have their mask on. I some, saw someone who wasn't social distancing where Americans tattle on Americans, you want to live in that kind of environment, then put Tim Walls into the vice presidency and you'll start seeing a lot more of that. Tim Walls and Kamala Harris do not believe in free speech when free speech is used in a way that is uh, politically incorrect. Notice this particular article, again, October the 13th, twenty. 24 it's entitled fox news channels shannon bream to tim walls who gets to decide what misinformation is what a great question that is hey we're going to come down on people circulating misinformation well what is misinformation and who gets to be the final arbiter of what misinformation or disinformation is because if you can't answer that question then you're creating a world where free speech could disappear just like that. I mean, we are so close in the United States to losing free speech. It's hard for me to place a greater emphasis on this. Fox News host Shannon Bream asked Governor Tim Walls during an interview Sunday about misinformation and censorship. Here's what Shannon Bream said. You've said there's no guarantee of free speech for misinformation or hate speech. But first of all, the Supreme Court was very clear in a unanimous 2017 decision that hate speech is protected. And that's the kind of stuff that needs to be protected. None of us like to hear, but more importantly, who gets to decide on the issue of what misinformation is? In other words, Mr. Walls, with what the two of you are doing with donor lists of advocacy groups, you're going against the Supreme Court precedent. When you say um, we're going to police hate speech, you're going against Supreme Court precedent. And these guys are acting like those Supreme Court precedents don't even exist. You're calling things misinformation. Well, who gets to decide what misinformation means? That's a great question from Shannon Bream of Fox News. Tim Wall's answer. 
The issue on this was the hate speech and the protected speech, speech that is aimed at creating violence, speech that's aimed at threats to individuals. The decision on that society decides a lot of this, the idea of someone going on and threatening someone else's life or child's life online. So if you happen to be pro-life in your orientation or politically incorrect in your political views, then he's analogizing you to a violent person and he's analogizing you to a child abuser. So they're, they're putting people that use free speech in a way that goes against what they think you should hear or see or think in the most vilest categories possible, and they're developing a case that your free speech should be limited, restricted, and perhaps you should even go to jail. Shannon Bream says there's a distinction, you would say, though, between something like a threat and misinformation. Walls says the difference is threats, that type of speech. You want to make uh, Planned Parent executives look bad, then you're violent, and you're a hater, and you're a child abuser. So the First Amendment doesn't cover you. Remember, if you watch the vice presidential debate between uh, Tim Walls and J.D. Vance, this issue came up, and Walls in that debate said you can't shout fire in a crowded theater, meaning if you're using free speech in a way that is outside of what we deem acceptable, then you're no different than summoning people to eminent violent action. I mean, those are his words, not my words. You can't shout fire in a crowded theater, and he's laying out the precursor, the case, for the disintegration of the First Amendment once he, along with Kamala Harris, takes power. So what you're seeing is uh, a unique time period that we're living in where the stage is being set for the persecution of God's people. The First Amendment won't help you should these people gain power in the United States of America uh, November the 5th. Now, I remember the good old days when we used to try to convince people that the current trajectory of the Democratic Party has absolutely nothing to do with Christianity. I mean, maybe things were different in prior days, but not today. When you look at the Democratic policies on homosexuality, Israel, when you look at the Democratic policies on the unborn, or their advocacy for things like what Tim Walls signed into law, the Born Alive Law, where a baby that survives a botched abortion that's struggling for life on the table, fully alive, gets no legal protection. You look at things like that in the Democratic Party and you open your Bible and you can see that the current trajectory of the Democratic Party has absolutely nothing to do with the Bible. And anybody that claims the name of Christ and votes Democrat, it's like they're taking their Bible and putting it aside and saying it has absolutely no influence on my voting. There is no harmony between the Christian worldview and the current trajectory of the Democratic Party. Now, in days past, we used to have to try to make that case. Guess what, folks? We don't have to make that case anymore. You know why? Because the Democrats themselves are saying that. The Democrats themselves are saying Christianity has no place in the Democratic Party. Now, to help us with that, Notice uh, this particular article here from TrendingPoliticsNews.com, October 18th, 2024. It says, just in. Kamala is embroiled in a new scandal after stunning anti-Christian comments. The article says, the event unfolded in La Crosse, I believe, Wisconsin, where Harris took the stage to promote her agenda, focusing on topics like abortion rights and reproductive health. 
abortions, in other words. As Harris was addressing the crowd, a voice from the audience interrupted, shouting, Jesus is Lord. It was at this moment, or it was this moment that ignited a firestorm as Harris responded with what some see as a dismissive and anti-Christian comment. Harris said in response, quote, oh, I think you guys are at the wrong rally. What is she saying here? If you believe Jesus is Lord, you have no, you're at the wrong rally. I mean, you have no place in the Democratic Party. The Democratic Party does not want you. Very interesting because we used to try to convince people that there's no harmony between the Bible, Christianity, and the Democratic Party. We don't even have to make that argument anymore. It's the Democratic Party itself that goes around saying this. I mean, it's the Democratic Party that almost voted God completely out of the party in their documents a few years back. They almost completely voted Israel out of their party a few uh, protection for Israel foreign policy wise a few election cycles back and now here's Kamala Harris at a rally telling people that say Jesus is Lord you're at the wrong rally so all of these uh, Christians for Hamal uh, Harris types Ron Sider you know Anthony Campolo um, Brian McLaren a number of others that we could think of. Kamala Harris is saying, if you believe Jesus is Lord, you have no place in the Democratic Party. And, and what do you think someone with this mentality is going to do to Christians in the United States with the power of the State Department and the Patriot Act at her fingertips? Here's something from X posted by Charlie Kirk. And he writes here, here's a firsthand account from a Trump supporter who was at Kamala's rally and happened to be filming when she told Christians they were at the wrong rally. So you can go to his uh, feed there and watch that yourself. And notice also what Michigan, very blue state, Governor Gretchen Whitmer did recently. Notice this article from the ChristianPost.com, October 14th, 2024. Gretchen Whitmer apologizes for misconstrued video mocking Eucharist with a Dorito. Democratic Michigan Governor Gretchen Whit Whitmer raised eyebrows for a video that went viral on social media Thursday and appeared to show her offering a Dorito to a feminist podcaster as if it were the Roman Catholic Eucharist. After placing the chip in planks, that's the end of podcaster's mouth or tongue, in a way some critics condemned as blasphemous and vaguely pornographic, Whitmer gazed into the camera while wearing a Harris Walls hat. Paul Long, who serves as president and CEO of the Michigan Catholic Conference, said Whitmer and Plank's skit goes further than viral, the viral online trend that inspired it, specifically uh, imitating the posture and gestures of Catholics receiving holy Eucharist, in which we believe that Jesus Christ is truly present. It's not just distasteful or strange. It's not all too. It's not an all too familiar. Uh, rather, it is an all too familiar example of an elected official mocking religious persons and their practices. While dialogue on this issue with the governor's office is appreciated whether or not insulting Catholics and the Eucharist was the intent, it has had an offensive impact, uh, he said. So you notice that Gretchen Whitmer only apologized for this because there was a backlash and probably because we're in an election year. 
But otherwise, she, a very Democrat governor in a very blue state, has absolutely no problem mocking people of faith. Now, I don't agree with Roman Catholic theology. I don't think, I don't agree with the Roman Catholic theological understanding of the Eucharist. I don't believe Christ is physically present at the Eucharist. I believe they're memorial devices at our church. We serve communion once a month, and I explain this distinction. So why am I sticking up for the Roman Catholics here? For one very simple reason. If they can do this to Roman Catholics, they can do it to anybody, including me and including you or any other person of faith. I mean, these are people that hate Christianity, hate Christians, have no problem publicly denigrating Christians, and you need to think about that when you go and you vote November 5th, because you could be voting for someone who is going to use the full power of government to persecute God's people across the board, whether you agree with everyone theologically or not. That is the type of Revelation 17, verse 6 that we read earlier, environment that we are about to enter into. Keep in mind, I think it was last Easter, if I'm not mistaken, that happened to coincide with Trans Day. The Biden administration declared that particular Sunday, Easter Sunday, not as a sacred holiday for Christians, but he uh, decided to call that, I can't remember exactly what he said, but it was Transvestite Day trans day so what he did because of the collision of transvestite day with resurrection sunday is he gave transvestite day in his comments the upper hand and so what he just did in the process is disrespected the highest holy day for christians for the last two thousand years Easter Sunday, Resurrection Sunday, the time we celebrate or commemorate the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ from the grave. And you're going to label that some kind of trans day? That's the attitude that these people have towards your deeply held, biblically-based sentiments. And my question is, if they get the reins of power, what are they going to do with the reins of power against God's people. What's interesting is we actually have the power to stop this from happening from the human perspective. And yet most Christians, or a big chunk of Christians, I would say, a substantial minority of Christians won't even take time to vote. Notice this uh, is a screenshot taken from Fox News related to recent research by George Barna, it says one third of theologically defined evangelicals do not vote. Now this is related to some research that top statistician George Barna compiled. Notice this from the Cultural Research Center. It says 104 million people of faith, including 32 million Christian regular churchgoers, are projected to abstain from voting in November, based on research conducted by Dr. George Barna. Notice this particular screenshot. Here are some things that he said in his research. The key, he said, would be as simple as pastors encouraging people to vote in order to fulfill their biblical responsibility. An estimated 5 million regular churchgoers would be likely to vote as a result of that simple exhortation, he said. That in and of itself could change the outcome of the election by encouraging people to simply do their job and getting their congr congregants to fulfill their duties as American citizens. So if...
pastors simply started to speak up and say, you know what, as a Christian, you have a duty to vote and you should vote biblical truth to the best of your ability. I could swing the entire election by that simple exhortation. So I'm a pastor. If it helps, I'll give you the exhortation now. It's God's will for you to vote. Abstaining from the vote is like telling the salt and light of the earth or the salt to get back in the salt shaker and telling the light to be hidden under a bushel. I mean, when when 32 million Christians vacate any area of life, it's never good. Particularly politics and voting, since politics and voting is largely going to determine the type of country that we're going to live in, a, a religiously free, pluralistic country or a religiously oppressive country. And we talk about persecution in the last days. What's interesting is we're bringing that largely on ourselves by failing to be salt and light. Yes, the end time scenario will happen like God says. But we are to occupy until he comes. We have the power to delay the decay simply by registering and voting biblically. And yet we're learning from this research by Dr. George Barna that a large chunk of the Christian community doesn't vote and will not vote. And so when this persecution breaks out, in essence, we will have no one to blame but ourselves. Notice uh, this particular article here from the Washington Stand. October 8th, 2024, written by Suzanne Bodie. To the 40 million Christians unlikely to vote this November, she says, you need to repent, meaning change your mind about this issue. She writes, according to some shocking statistics from George Barna at Arizona Christian University, as many as 40 million Christians plan to sit this election out more than enough to hand the country's keys to the eager and radical left. Incredibly, the research conducted between August and September suggests that 41 million self-described born-again Christians are unlikely to vote this November election. To Len Munsell, president of ACU, that spells disaster. I see two huge takeaways from this blockbuster report, he explained. First, that Christians could be the deciding factor in a bunch of federal and state races and are choosing not to be. And second, he continued that they are longing for their local church to instruct them on how to think biblically about policy and politics. They don't want to be told how to vote, Munsell said, but they want to know why they should vote and how to view the political issues from a biblical framework. When Christians were asked to explain their complacency, 68% said they weren't interested in politics, followed by 57% who disliked both presidential candidates and another 52% who believe that their vote won't make a difference. In a sad sign of where we are as a country, 48% also worry that the election results will be manipulated. Of course, one of the most problematic aspects of this passivity is that November 5th involves a lot more than the White House. In fact, Family Research Council President Tony Perkins argues that many would contend that there are much more important decisions in the presidency on the state and local ballot control of the House and the Senate hangs in the balance. Governors, state attorney, attorneys general, generals, local school boards, even comptrollers are amassing major victories in protecting children from radical gender ideology, pushing back on corporate America's woke agenda, fighting the Biden administration's lawless overreach, and passing sweeping pro-life and pro-parent laws. While we might not have the ideal situation at the top of the ballot, he wrote in decision-making, Americans have several 
other issues to be mindful of as we head to the polls. In our hands rest the hopes of soldiers on foreign battlefields, the persecuted church in faraway lands, and the peace of God's chosen nation, the nation of Israel, Perkins warned. Think about what has happened in America in just 35 years. Cornerstone, chapel pastor, senior pastor Gary Hamrick told pray vote stand summit on Saturday. Think about the things. Think about these things. Think about gender confusion. Think about marriage redefinition. There's been a disregard for life. There's become or come environmental worship, the stripping of parental authority, the devotion of religious liberties, and the list goes on and on. How absurd, he went on, that in a matter of a generation, people are now trying to figure out what bathroom to use. Businesses are being sued for not baking cakes or doing graphic designs for same-sex weddings. The nanny state has approved pornographic reading material in many public school systems. It's illegal to distribute sea turtles in South Florida, but not illegal to abort babies from a womb. This is complete insanity. And frankly, Hamrick declared, we have no one to blame but ourselves. He says, if you thought the last 30 years was disturbing, imagine the next 35 years. Why is it that when Hamrick continuing, why is it that when it comes to the family, people are protective of the family, Christians in particular? When it comes to the church, Christians in particular want to care for the church and defend the church. But when it comes to the third institution, the second one that God ordained, and all of a sudden people say, well, that one doesn't need my involvement, that one doesn't need my particip participation. That one doesn't need for me to be engaged. I mean, why do we defend the church as an institution of God, the family as an institution of God, but we won't defend government, which was also created by God as a divine institution, and we won't take time to understand the issues, and we won't even take time to show up and vote? That's what Hamrick is rightfully condemning here. He says, and get over trying to find the perfect candidate, Hamrick admonished. There is no candidate who is the full package because Jesus is not on the ballot. There is no perfect person running, he pointed out. And God has used both righteous leaders and unrighteous leaders all the way through his Bible or the Bible to accomplish his purposes. A lot of people say, well, I don't like Trump, so I'm not going to show up and vote. Uh, okay, you're going to give up on all the other issues on the ballot because you don't like Trump? And why don't you like Trump? Well, he said something mean a few years back on his Twitter feed. So that means you're pro-Harris? Because if you don't vote for Trump, it in essence is a vote for Kamala Harris. And by not showing up and voting for the entity that's closest to obstructing the progressive agenda, which in this case is Donald Trump, you're playing matador defense against the progressive agenda, taking away the defense against the progressive agenda through Kamala Harris, making the moral destruction and economic destruction of the United States within the reach of the political left. That's what this political apathy does. It doesn't, it's not neutral. It empowers one side over the other. This is what happens when 41 million Christians become apathetic about this issue of voting. They're putting into place persecution which the Bible says will come in the last days. But it's interesting that when the persecution breaks out, and it will break out, given what Harris and Walls did in their respective roles in California and Minnesota, 
you know, the past in that sense is prologue. When the persecution breaks out, the Christian community, because of its apathy in this area of voting, will have absolutely no one to blame but themselves. On this note, let me close here with this article from World Net Daily, October 28, 2024, written by David uh, Kuplian, if I'm pronouncing that right. It's entitled, An Open Letter to Lilla Rose and Other Pro-Lifers Planning Not to Vote for Tr Donald Trump. This particular pro-life leader that he is addressing said, If the election were today, I would not vote for Harris or Trump based on their policies and their statements and their positions. Because I don't completely line up with Donald Trump on a single issue, a very important issue, the issue of pro-life, the issue of voting, I'm going to abstain from the election. That's how a lot of conservatives and Christians think. But notice this reaction here as he writes this letter to this Lilla Rose who has this mentality. Obviously, this letter is, is too long to read in its entirety, but just a few excerpts. Dear Lilla, if I'm pronouncing that right, we've never personally met, but as a pro-life journalist, I've appreciated your activism since way back when you were a teenager doing awesome hidden camera sting operations with James O'Keefe. By the way, that's exactly what Kamala Harris went after legally as the attorney general in California. The letter says, as President Donald Trump did what none of his pro-life predecessors, including Ronald Reagan, could accomplish. While under continual heavy fire from the Democrats, the media, and the deep state who persecuted, impeached, and undermined and lied about him at every turn, Trump somehow managed to appoint three pro-life Constitution honoring justices to the United States Supreme Court and thereby threw the doors wide open to accomplish the first of the pro-life movement's two goals. Of course, as the Catholic News Agency reported, Trump also used his executive power to restrict foreign funding of abortion and to prevent Title X funding from going to the abortion industry. As President Trump signed an executive order to protect infants who were born alive after a failed abortion. In June, Trump said in a speech to the Faith and Freedom Coalition that if elected, he would rapidly review the cases of pro-life activists and every political prisoner who has been jailed under, the pre under President Joe Biden's administration and get them back to their families since that's where they belong. Kamala Harris will do none of these things, but Trump did them. The letter says, now consider what Kamala Harris and Tim Walls will do with regard to abortion if elected next month. Both are beyond radical in their passionate love for abortion. Harris has repeatedly vowed to codify Roe into federal law. She and Walls have absolutely no problem with performing abortions all the way through nine months of pregnancy up to the moment of birth and in fact oppose the born alive infant protection laws of any sort. In May of 2023, Walls signed a bill into Minnesota law removing a requirement to save the life of a baby born alive after an attempted abortion. Please consider a couple of unchangeable facts. By all accounts, November's election will be very close, which means every vote counts. If a registered voter decides not to vote or to write someone else's name on their ballot, he or she is voting for Harris and Tim Walls. The math is simple and inescapable. Not voting for Trump is mathematically identical to voting for Harris when the ballots are counted. Now, that's a point I was trying to make a little earlier. The candidate with the most votes wins and takes over the country. 
And as I wrote shortly before the 2020 election, when you vote for a president, you are not choosing only one leader and his policy agenda, but multiple leaders and policies in every area of life, and therefore the whole future for the country, as Franklin Graham put it, hangs in the balance. Most prominently, you are choosing vice presidents who may well become a president, as has happened 14 times in United States history. You are also choosing cabinet and department heads. You are choosing federal judges, including Supreme Court justices with lifetime tenure who will decide issues of stupendous importance that affect every American and you are choosing thousands of other people. About 4,000 government appointees in all will profanely, or excuse me, profoundly shape the nation in which your children and grandchildren will live for a long time. Who do you want, folks, making those 4,000 appointments? Harris or Trump? Uh, Speaking of these 4,000 appointees who will affect your children and grandchildren for a long time, whether for good or for ill. One last point, the letter says. These are not normal times. This is not an era when one can reasonably greet defeat by saying, oh, well, so the Democrats won this time. They'll teach the Republicans, Republicans to be more diligent in their pro-life walk the next time. There may be no next time. As many of today's best historians and analysts are currently warning. If Trump loses, this could be the last genuine election America ever has. Uh, Lila, or Lila, the person that's being addressed, the letter says, you are all about life, innocent life, which includes not only the lives of the pre-born, but also the lives of tens of thousands of children currently being sold into sex slavery thanks to the Biden Harris immigration policies, as well as the lives of young people killed by fentanyl poisoning, currently the biggest cause of death of young Americans between age 18 and 45, and the lives of countless children being destroyed by being seduced into the transgender madness. By the way, Tim Walls last year made Minnesota into a sanctuary state for minors seeking mutilating transgender surgeries, even against the wishes of their own parents. And on and on. All of this madness and heartache will increase exponentially under a Harris-Walls administration. Before it's too late, please rethink your public position on this election and your voice of support for the president who, by God's grace, finally accomplished the first of the pro-life movement's two major goals, which was Donald Trump, who through his judicial appointments ultimately had Roe versus Wade overturned. Now, what he is saying here was so good, I, I can't even put what he said into my own words. That's why I did a little extensive reading. It is intellectual and moral sanity for a person that's biblically influenced to sit out this election because they disagree with Trump or whoever on a particular policy point. You... You, you are throwing away so much that you perhaps don't understand or grasp. And if a person is willing to throw away so much because they disagree with someone because of a tweet or because of a point, are we really being the salt and light that God has called us to be? 
I would I would say that we are that we are not. So that's why I brought this to your attention from World Net Daily, an open letter to Lilla Rose and other pro-lifers planning not to vote for Donald Trump. Uh, you can probably tell based on the amount of time I'm spending on this that this is a passion of mine. I do have an ambition to see Christians think biblically about politics and vote accordingly. I have a book that is coming out. We're hoping to have it out at least in the form of an ebook before the election. Uh, the title of it is The Bible and Your Vote Biblical Principles for Any Election. And this book will equip you with what the Bible says on a range of issues which will equip you related to how you should vote uh, biblically in any election cycle. And so um, keep your eyes out for that. We will announce it when uh, it becomes available, hopefully before the election, in ebook e format. Even if it doesn't, it, still, it will still be viable for any other election because these. this is a book not about particular political parties or personalities or the latest soap opera in the political world, but issues where God has spoken that matter to God. So you'll be equipped how to think biblically and politically, and you'll be equipped how to vote. So kind of in summary, in this particular prophecy update, We've looked at three major issues, globalism, Babylon, and persecution. Uh, there are things in place that are paving our way into global governance, even related to this looming election, which we've talked about. Babylon is on the rise. We've discussed its role uh, prophetically. And the Bible predicts a scenario of persecution in the last days. Uh, I'm embarrassed to admit that a lot of this persecution that's about to break out in North America, we will have largely had the power to prevent simply by doing our Christian duty to vote. And I've tried to bring that issue to your attention as well. Of course, our ultimate hope is not in who wins the White House, but it's in the promise of Jesus in Titus 2.13 um, Paul, writing of that promise, says, Looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. As Adrian Rogers would often quip, the world is growing gloriously dark. As the tribulation period and its shadows are approaching, what's coming even faster is that promise that Jesus will take us out of this world before the wrath of God hits. There's a lot we can do to promote good while we're here, occupy until he comes. We can prevent a lot of suffering simply by being uh, innocent as doves and as wise as serpent, serpents in this area of voting. But whether we're successful in delaying the decay or not, our hope doesn't ride on that. It rides on the soon return of Jesus in the rapture. So the signs of the tribulation period tell us that the rapture is coming even faster because the rapture will precede the tribulation period. And so this is a great time to know Jesus personally. So you can be tied into this promise. The way to know Jesus personally is to accept by faith his free gift that he provided for you 2,000 years ago. His final words on the cross were, it is finished. And if we trust in what he did for us 2,000 years ago, which is another way of saying believe, then just like that, we're made right with him. We're spared from God's coming wrath. We're tied into his promises, including this promise of the rapture. I hope many people within the sound of my voice will be placing their personal faith in the work of the Savior. I want to remind you that pastor's uh, point of view and all of our recent teachings and all of our teachings for that matter are regular being, regularly being uploaded on the Andy Woods Ministries app. 
Just go to the App Store, type in Andy Woods Ministries into the search engine and enjoy our content through our free app. If you want to catch Pastor's Point of View in podcast format, go to wherever it is you get your podcast, type in Andy Woods Ministries into the search engine and enjoy Pastor's Point of View in podcast format. Please go to our website, andywoodsministries.org to get our content. And also there is a conspicuous way uh, on the um, homepage to sign up for the show notes. So these articles that we read from, once you sign up, will show up in your inbox every time we post a pastor's point of view show. I'm also the president of a seminary, Chafer Theological Seminary. If you're interested in pursuing seminary education, check out Chafer Theological Seminary. Our journal is out, the second issue after being out of commission for a long time is about to be released so you can get cutting edge academic articles on our distinctives free grace dispensationalism those kind of things in this particular journal encourage you to look into that if you're interested i also want to make you aware of the sugarland bible church prophecy conference profcon as we call it Coming up Friday, February the 21st of 2025, uh, we're going to have a banquet that evening at nearby Sugar Creek Country Club. We'll have the all-day prophecy conference Saturday, February the 22nd, and then our speakers will be sticking around Sunday um, to uh, participate in our normal worship services and present in our normal worship services here at Sugarland Bible Church. Special music for the banquet is going to be provided by Claude and Rebecca Chu, and conference music is going to be provided by Olam Worship. Speakers will include Bill Federer, Olivier Melnick, Dr. Randall Price, and myself, cutting information on worldview, the Middle East, the end times, the title of the conference is From Faith to Final Days. We need you to register, and we need you to register fast because it's filling up for both the conference and then the all-day, well, the all-day conference on Saturday and the banquet on Friday night. Go to slbc.org uh, to sign up. We're about ready to release some very short advertisements and infomercials on social media alerting people to the conference as well. So you'll receive a reminder that way. And also November 1st through 3rd, don't forget about the World View Weekend Conference at Lake of the Ozarks featuring Brandon House, Rob Manus, Bill Frederer, Aaron Lavarco, myself, Patrick Wood, Leo Homan, Dr. Rob Linstead, Sharam Hadian, James Thorpe. Tremendous lineup, a Worldview Conference. And if you can't make it live, it's a wonderful time at Lake of the Ozarks uh, to participate in this conference. But if you can't make it live, I believe that live streaming options are available for this particular conference. So go to wvwtvstore.com to learn about the live streaming option or ticket options. And then last but least, um, I'm going to be involved along with many others in the pre-trib study group. I believe that's December 9th through 11th at the end of this year. And it's going to be cutting edge uh, academic papers on eschatology and the signs of the times meeting in the Dallas area. Check that out at pre-trib.org. Went a little longer than I normally go uh, in this particular session, but I felt the information was important enough given the looming election uh, November the 5th. So whatever happens in this coming election, um, keep it in prayer, and I'll be with you the week right after, where I'll be bringing you another prophecy update here on Pastor's Point of View. Thank you for watching. 
Thank you for listening. Thank you for sharing. Thank you for praying for this ministry. We'll see you next time on Pastor's Point of View. Thank you for watching and listening. God bless you.